defining what you know success looks like for you is super important because I think most people haven't done that. It's a really basic exercise. Business of Architecture, episode 251. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is your guide to discover the tips, strategies, and secrets for running an impactful and hyper-profitable architecture practice. You know, one time I had a listener write into me and take exception to the fact that I say Architect Nation because he felt that I was being exclusive just for the United States, but he was missing the point. When I say Architect Nation, I'm referring to you wherever in the world you are because we are all one nation of architects all around the world trying to make this world a better place through the built environment. Now, if you haven't already, I invite you to head on over, get free instant access to the four-part architecture firm profit map video by going to freearchitectgift.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. You can get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Today, I welcome back to the show, Eric Reinholdt. Eric Reinhold is the owner of 30 by 40 Design Workshop based out of Mount Desert, Maine. His designs focus on simple, modern, residential architecture. In addition to being an architect, Eric is one of the top architect content creators on YouTube. Practically every single week since 2013, Eric has produced and released a video on YouTube dealing with design and architecture. The topics of his videos range from design critiques to book and product reviews to behind the scenes video blogs of his life and studio. In today's episode, you'll discover how Eric manages his time to get the most important strategic tasks done. You'll discover why Eric is focused on building assets over time instead of just responding to the day-to-day fires. You'll also hear why Eric vets potential architecture clients and how he decides which projects he'll take on and which ones aren't a fit. Probably my biggest takeaway from this episode is Eric's focus on taking the actions and being intentional about his day so he can live the kind of life that he wants to live. Eric Reinhold, welcome back to part two here on the business of architecture. Hey, thanks, Enoch. Glad to be here. So I thought we'd touch on something that you, that you talked about a little bit last time. You talked about this idea of content creation. Uh, you explained how in your business you do architectural design, but as well, you have a whole content side of the business, which involves a YouTube channel, selling certain products on YouTube. And our listeners can go back and listen to that episode to find out how in the heck you make money off of YouTube or how someone does that. <laughs> But you mentioned in terms of your schedule for getting things out, you mentioned that you really are juggling a lot of things. Um, you know, I know as uh, when I was doing a lot more architecture myself, it's hard enough to be able to get the architecture side of work done, let alone trying to run a successful YouTube channel. And uh, in your blog video, in your vlog video that you talked about recently, uh, you, you said something, and I'm just going to read the quote out here. Your thoughts on entrepreneurship. You were walking us through the day. And I'll put a link to that on Business of Architecture so you guys can check out that vlog. But Eric was talking about inter- entrepreneurship and saying, you need to be pretty disciplined, uh, but there's nothing better, in my opinion, than choosing what you get to work on. So I'd like to talk to you, Eric, about, about your discipline. How do you structure your day to make sure that you're getting the important things done. Yeah, it's um. This is something that I'm kind of a geek about. Um, and I it started a couple of years ago. Um, I found this Paul Graham essay. So Paul Graham is the founder of Y Combinator. It's kind of like a, a startup accelerator. Um, and he published this article. I think it was back in 2009. It's called Makers Schedule, Managers Schedule. And you know they're talking about it in terms of software developers and and coders and things like that um, versus their managers. And they're talking about sort of differences in how the manager always wants to have a meeting, but for the code, the person who's writing code, like a meeting is the worst thing possible because they just need these large blocks of time to dig in and get into what they're doing. And so this this really resonated with me. This idea that there was like, you know, in a business, there's a CEO and then there's the sort of worker bee. And so dividing your business between these sort of two modes of operation was something that I thought, I might as well try this. Like th- this sounds like there's a, this has some, you know, ideas that I can, that are really resonating with me. And so I decided to split my day just right down the middle. Um, and my morning schedule, because I'm a morning person, um, would all be dedicated to making things. And my afternoon schedule would all be dedicated to managing things. 
And so I very, you know, strict routine on how I do that now. Um, I didn't back then, but you know, over time I've developed this, like I'm going to rise between four and 5 AM, like really early because that is where, you know, I feel like I'm ahead of everybody else. You people on the West coast are all sleeping. So I know I've got, I've got you beat there. Right. Um, I'm just kidding, but it's like kind of fuel for, you know, my internal like productivity fire here. So I get up early and I have, you know, a couple of sausages, a couple of, you know, some protein is important. So that's, that's very important. And then I caffeinate and then I head into the studio and I make things. And the stuff that I make is the stuff that I put on the list from the night before. So all this is, is like most people, I think when they get into the office in the morning, like first thing they're doing is checking email and responding to email. I just like flip that. So I put all of that stuff that most people would normally do in the morning. I put that in the afternoon because I know that like, you know, on a fresh head of sleep, I can sit down and dig in and be, do really focused, concentrated work for a pretty long period of time. Like I'm talking like six to eight hours of good time. So from four in the morning till about noon is what I do all creative work. If I'm writing, um, I'm scripting things, I'm recording video, I'm doing design work, things like that. All that stuff fits in that morning chunk. And then I basically take like an hour to go for a hike. So I break between the, the making in the morning and the managing in the afternoon with exercise. And so this is one of those non-negotiables for me. Like I have to have exercise in the day. Excuse me. And I use that to break the morning and the afternoon. So I go for a hike and while I'm hiking, I'm sort of, I'm listening to podcasts, a um, whole bunch of podcasts and I'm just kind of cross pollinating. So I'm trying to get other ideas into my head. And, you know, usually from working on all that creative work in the morning, I'll have some problem that I'm kind of stuck on. And so this break, you know, gives time for those ideas and those thoughts to incubate. And if I'm listening to other ideas and new ideas, like this exercise piece is like part of my creative process. That's how I view it now. Like when I'm out hiking, like the ideas are flowing. Like I always have a notebook with me um, or I'm recording ideas on my phone because like it's just this incredible flow of information that's happening. And I don't know, I can't really explain why that happens, but it does. And, um, you know, I actually rely on that as part of my creative process. So when I'm done with the hike, then it's all like phone calls and emails and meetings. Um, I schedule all of that stuff. I'm really intentional about scheduling that only in the afternoons. Um, despite people crying and whining about it, it just is so easy to do when you just say, look, this is how I have my day set up. You know, like after this um, phone call, Enoch, you know, I have a couple of meetings that are set up because everything gets pushed to the afternoon. Um, and then I end the day with, um, by setting the following day's schedule. So that's the, the managing, last managing component. And then, um, I usually try and read for a little bit. So whether that's, you know, research for a project that I'm doing or if it's just recreational reading, I try and really have a diversity of experience. And, um, you know, I've designed the day just to prioritize the things that I like doing, the things that make me happiest instead of, you know, prioritizing like everyone else's to-do list. Like the email thing is just everyone else's to-do list. And everybody knows that. Like, you, you know that you could spend a long time cutting through emails, you know, sorting through your inbox, but it's just getting everybody else's to-do list done, not, not the stuff that lights you up creatively. So that's, that's, does that explain the day? It does. Awesome. And uh, it's funny because when I, I showed my wife your, your vlog and we were watching it together and, you know, there's the part in the middle of the day where you, you jump out for your, as you call it, your non-negotiable exercise. All right. And it's quite wintry outside. And you strap on <laughs> yeah. your snowshoes and you have the drone shot of like you walking through the, the woods <laughs> and my wife just laughs. She says, oh my goodness, I would never do that. And I said, that looks awesome. <laughs> it's so good, man. And there's nobody out there. I mean, it's brilliant. It really is brilliant. I, I, I look forward to that. So yes, I realize most people wouldn't do that, but you know, I feel like, yeah. That's just, it may be particular to me, but it doesn't have to be strapping on snowshoes, obviously. It could be headed to the gym or something like that. But just that break of exercise is super important to me. <laughs> and you talked about that being a really creative process where you let your mind flow, you, you, you put content into your mind. Uh, can you share with us what are some of the content producers of the podcast that you're listening to right now that you're finding really inspiring? Yeah, so... Um, 
Seth Godin, who's a marketer, I'm sure you know Seth Godin. He just came out with a new podcast that I'm really loving. It's called Akimbo. Um, so that's great for getting me to think at um, sort of higher level business strategies. And I just, he, he's a great storyteller. And so for me, it's kind of researching how to tell stories. And he, he has these kind of bite-sized stories that are just so awesome. Um, so really appreciating his stuff. Um, Chase Jarvis, who's the founder of Creative Live. He's also a photographer. Um, he's got a fantastic podcast where he interviews all kinds of creative people. Um, so I love listening to that because it's not, it's not necessarily just architects. It's photographers. It's graphic designers. It's filmmakers. So love that kind of as a creative infusion. Um, there's cool tools. I don't know if you know that one. That's um, it's by Kevin Kelly, the founder of wired. Um, that's just kind of like a geek tech podcast. Love listening to that. Cause there's lots of different software tools. Like I feel like some, it's easy to get stuck in a routine where you're using the same tools um, and not look for other things. And so that's pretty high level. Like, Hey, here's a new app you should check out. So there's that. Um, there's Debbie Millman's Design Matters, which I absolutely love. Um, she's just a great thought leader in the in the graphic design space and design space. There's Gary Vee, there's Tim Ferriss, Pat Flynn, you know, you, you name it. Every, somebody's got a new podcast every time I, I go out there. And of course, Business of Architecture. <laughs> awesome. Um, Eric, tell me, let's talk about this time blocking and getting stuff done. Maybe we should have prefaced it with what are the what are the demands on your time? What are you managing here? Maybe that would have been the best question to start out with to give our people some uh, some our listener today some perspective. Sure. Um so I have a couple of arms to my business. Basically, I have a product side to my business and I have a service side to the business. And the idea is over time to really develop the product side of the business to be bigger than the service side of the business because, you know, part of my sort of success metrics is to control my time. You know, I want to be able to say, you know, what I'm doing with my time. And, you know, time is that asset that we can never get more of. So as long as I control what I'm doing with my time, you know, that, that's the important part for me. So when I'm thinking about what I have to manage, I have to manage those two sides of the business right now. So the client side, um, and I try to accept a couple of projects at a time just so that there's some overlap. You know, if I've shipped a design to a client and I'm waiting for feedback, I can go ahead and step into another design project. Um, but these aren't huge projects by any means. I'm not designing 10,000 square foot houses or anything like that. These are pretty modest houses. Um, and just with clients that I know, it's sort of higher end clientele. So there's fee to that makes, has that make sense? Um, so I don't need to take 10 different projects. And that's, that's another thing that I think a lot of architects maybe uh, misjudge. Like if you're going after 10 renovation projects versus waiting for one you know, new construction project. And I realize this isn't possible for everybody, but just in terms of the thought exercise, like if you divide your time into 10, 10 different pieces and you have to do all the same things in each one of those 10 slots, you're going to have no time left. So there's a very intentional means of like vetting clients and vetting projects that allows me to do this schedule. Um, and that is accepting a limited number of things. So I have design projects that I'm fitting into this creative time. And then I have content creation that I'm fitting in this time. And Right now, since a lot of my focus is the YouTube channel, I am you know, making content from the time that I am working on my clients' projects for the most part. You know, obviously, like this past week, I've just done a, a book review. And so those things tend to take less time to create in terms of a video. Um, and there's no overlap. Like that's not work that I'm going to repurpose for a client meeting or anything. But like the vlog that we've been talking about, um, that one I was designing elevations for a client, and you know, so I needed that work done anyway. I might as well put a camera on me, and so I'm designing for the client. I'm getting paid for that ideally, and um, then I'm also making content for the YouTube channel. So those things can overlap. But th those are the kinds of things that I'm fitting into that. So it's, you know, it'll be scripting, it'll be taking photos, it'll be recording video, it'll be design, it'll be drawing, all those things. And so when we talked about me getting up at four, you know, as long as I know this day is for, you know, like, let's say the video, I, I'm time blocking the video stuff because I want to have my equipment out once. I want to be, be able to film, get all the shots that I need. So I'll script out the shot list. I'll have the, the script that I'm using. And then when I get into the studio that day, I'm just blowing through all those shots and then I'll start to edit it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, if it's a day that I know, okay, I'm really going to be, um, 
you know, I need to get this door schedule done or whatever that is, you know, I'll, I'll fit all those things into that chunk too. So really time blocking is all about just being intentional and batching tasks wherever you can. You uh, tell me about your process for vetting clients. You said you're very strategic about the clients that you bring on because that helps in the end you manage your time better. What are you looking at uh, to make that work? You know, uh, so when I'm talking to a new client, uh, a new lead comes in and I've really tried to eliminate any kind of phone conversation um, at all until I know that we're going to be working together. So it's all done via email. And what I try to do is ask all the questions that, you know, most people want to pick up the phone and talk about. Um, I will ask them what their budget is, what their schedule is, what style of architecture they're looking for, who that, you know, all the questions that you can think of that would make you say yes or no to a project. I ask those right up front, like the first email, because I don't see any reason to beat around the bush. And so I have a certain set of metrics, like I'm looking for a certain level of project. I'm looking for certain answers. If people come to me saying they already have a design, it's a no. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole series of things like that, that I've developed that, um, are no's for me. <laughs> and then I, if I get to a yes, then, you know, it's something that we work together, but I, I immediately try and take, um, the pressure of schedule off the table. Um, always have a waiting list and, you know, that increases demand. And I think if you're looking to level up your project, your clientele, um, having that in place is a really it's a motivator. People want to work with you more when you have that actually. And um, if you're taking fewer projects, at, but they have larger budgets, they'll take longer to get through and you'll naturally develop a waiting list. So I think it's, it's all about being intentional and designing a system that's going to work for you. Um, I was never interested in doing 10 renovations simultaneously. Like just, it's too much for me to handle, especially as a one person operation. Like, you know, I want to do, smaller things. I want them to be custom. I want them to be interesting. And I know the kind of person that I'm looking to work with. And if you have a larger budget and longer time frame to work with, then, you know, you can wait, you can afford to wait a longer time to get, you know, those clients. If you have these shorter projects, they're smaller in scope, they take, you know, they're faster to complete, but the churn on your firm is like, it's just so much higher. I mean, you're always having to look for another renovation client. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. What would you say to uh, some of our listeners who are feeling overwhelmed with their day? They're feeling like they can't get those big rocks done. They feel like they're going from fire to fire. I mean, I would, <laughs> I would first say defining what... Um, you know, success looks like for you is super important because I think most people haven't done that. It's a really basic exercise. Um, and so like just my success metrics are freedom. So like freedom to choose whatever I work on every day purpose. Like I want to have something driving me forward. And ideally that's something that's a creative exercise and relationships. So like people, family, friends to share life with. Right. And so I know those three things, like without those three things, I'm not successful. And so everything that I'm doing to structure my day is to make sure that those things are at the top of the list, like that that's the priority. And so to do that, um, you know, knowing that I structure my day to do the things that are going to, you know, make me happiest. So I'm putting all like, I'm, I'm doing, I'm taking photographs during the day because I'm interested in that. And like maybe in the future, that's going to be another business, you know? Um, and I think we're all these kind of hyphens now, right? We're architects, but we're also artists. We're also, you know, fathers and sons and like all these things, like they can be all part of your practice. It doesn't have to be just architecture. And this is the thing that makes me happiest when I have all these different things to do. Like I love making videos. Not everybody loves doing that. I love taking photographs. Not everybody loves doing that. I love writing. I, like I love making architecture. So I structure my day to put all that stuff up front. Um, I think people who are fighting fires and trying to manage all these different things, I would encourage as a first step to flip all those things to the afternoon. Cause that's essentially what I've done, right? If you teach a contractor that you're going to answer their text within, you know, 10 seconds of you getting it every single, you know, Monday morning, like you've just taught them that that's an acceptable behavior to you and they're going to keep doing it. If you teach them that you only answer texts at, you know, one in the afternoon, like 
they're going to accept that as the behavior that gets them the answer they need. So why not just flip, you know, that model where take your most creative time. And for some people, it may not be the morning. Like my wife, she cannot get up in the morning. Like getting her out of bed at four in the morning, like for me is she, we wouldn't be able to do it. But for me, getting up at four in the morning, easy. Like I'm like, I'm awake. So I would say take where whatever your most creative time is, the time where you know you're able to get in a flow state and dedicate that time to the thing that you want to be doing. You know, if you want to be doing email, cool. Make, like make that your, you know, make that your thing. But I think most people don't want to be doing email first thing in the morning or doing all these managing tasks or, you know, having long meetings, like flip that stuff to the time when, you know, you have less creative energy and, really try and be, you know, intentional in how you use that time. It's just all about taking the time you have and allocating it in the most intentional and the smartest way. And for me, that's applying that creative, that, you know, my best energy to all my creative works and making all the things that I'm making, you know, um, products and plan sets and, you know, videos, all these things, like they light me up inside. Like I'm so happy at the end of the day when I've, when I'm done making those things and I can look at them and go, wow, yeah, this is really cool. I made this, you know, and for me, like architecture is one of those things, but it's not the whole thing. And, you know, architecture is funny because you, it takes a long time to make a building, <laughs> you know, from the first time you meet with the client, hash out the budget, you get the design going, like it's years. Right. And, when you're making a video or publishing a piece of content, like it can be a day. It can, it can be as short as you want it to be. Um, and so that's really gratifying. Having that diversity of, you know, creative pulls in your life is something that's made me really happy. And I would just encourage people to try it, experiment and, and see what works best for them. So Eric, you mentioned you get up around four or five every morning. What time do you generally go to bed? Uh, 10, 10, 30, 11, something like that. Yeah. So okay. I don't need a lot of sleep, but you know, so that wouldn't work for everybody. I, I totally get that. I, I, I'm not saying, I'm not saying this to be prescriptive about a time or like how many sausages you have to eat in the morning or any of that. It's really more about just being intentional and thinking about like, okay, this is when I operate best. Like if you don't operate well at four in the morning, there is absolutely zero point of forcing yourself to get up at four in the morning. Like my wife, when she is at work and she's like four to 8 p.m., she's like unstoppable. Like that's when she's getting the majority of her work done, but she knows that about herself. And so, you know, we structure the day to accommodate that because that's how, I mean, that's the thing about, you know, being a flexible, being an entrepreneur and like just noticing these things and patterns of life. Like once you do that, you like, you're just so far ahead of everybody else because everybody else is just reacting to all this other stuff, like react to this, react to that, have a meeting because so-and-so wants to have a meeting at eight in the morning. And, but don't react. Like, you, you can be creative and set your own schedule just like you're creative with your own design work. Like, be creative with your schedule. That, that's how I look at it. Do you use an alarm to get up in the morning? How does that work? Yeah, I do. Um, and it, but I'm not someone who snoozes. Like, I never hit the snooze button. So, um, it, there's tricks for this stuff too, you know, like in the winter, it's pretty hard for me to get up in the morning, you know, cause it's cold. And so, you know, like one of the tricks that they tell you is like, Hey, sleep with your socks on. So it's like one less thing you have to do. But I think the idea with that, like if you're someone who has a hard time getting up and motivated, you know, you can do the five, four, three, two, one, that, that thing, the countdown thing. I don't know if you ever heard that. No, tell um, me about that one. Oh, so that's a, so it's a, this book, um, uh, I forget who the author is, uh, forgive me, but um, it's, it's basically the countdown principle. And so the idea is that if you, if you give yourself that kind of a fixed deadline, you're so used to like the three, two, one launch like sequence, like you're so used to moving as a human and reacting to that sequence that if you do that in your head, when you get to one more often than not, you will react and get and, and start moving as opposed to doing one, two, three or five, like it's an infinite thing counting up right as opposed to counting down so i don't know it, it, that may not work but like the idea is to overcome inertia so like you know if it's a pain because you you're sitting in bed going oh i gotta get up i gotta make the coffee like i have all that set up so all i need to do is like flick a switch so i know that about myself i know that like any of those little pieces of inertia could stop me from going it's kind of like the gym like exercise thing like if your bag is packed and all the stuff's there. It's like one less excuse to keep you from doing that. So 
I think the idea is to do some research and think about what might, might work for you, but just remove those pieces of inertia that would keep you from getting up and going. So you mentioned having, you mentioned the sausages, but you mentioned the protein in the morning. I'm curious because from my own personal um, desire here, just to ask you the last question about diet, Eric, um, have you found a particular diet to be better for you in terms of peak performance and in terms of maintaining that energy throughout the day? Uh, the slow carb diet is what I'm on. So it's basically, you know, no white foods, no sugars, no carbs, um, except for Saturdays, which they call, you know, Tim Ferriss kind of, um, putting this up for a long time. And that's kind of how I discovered it. It's a great way to lose weight initially. Um, and then for me, it's just a great way to feel good about, you know, what I'm eating. I, I can't I can't pretend to be a diet expert. I'm someone who's like never eaten vegetables in their life, um, and I still don't. And so for me, it it fits perfectly. I can just kind of eat all this protein. So I don't know if it's a modified Atkins <laughs> the way I'm doing it or not, but um, it's probably unhealthy. But it feels good to me, and it works for me. Uh, so I'm definitely not a diet expert. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because I've just recently started doing oh. that, which is interesting that you mentioned that because I started a a, um, a low carb, a kind of a keto diet. Yeah. You know, if you do some research on that, it's sort of a modifi- modified Atkins. But I find that I would I was getting up at three in the morning, <laughs> and I was getting up like wide awake, like ready to go for the day. And that's not going to last. But um, so maybe that's something that other people can explore. I mean, I'm still kind of experimenting cool, with that. Yeah. So Eric, thank you so much for being honest with us today to discuss high productivity tips, time blocking discipline. It's been a fantastic conversation. Hey, good to talk with you, Enoch. Take care, man. You too. And that's a wrap. To discover more about the process for creating a better firm with less fires and more fun, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash freedom webinar. On that page, you'll be able to register for my next upcoming online training on how to create a firm that empowers your staff and is set to scale without chaining you to your desk. To discover how to market your firm to win better projects, sign up for my next free design firm marketing training at architectwebinar.com. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the all-in-one firm management software. Core helps you manage your projects and your finances to create a profitable and impactful firm. Get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the hosts and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world.